I'm Ryan O'Dowd, and you're listening to Ryan's Audiobooks on the Issues Magazine YouTube channel. Today I'm continuing with The Incarnation of Ahriman by Rudolf Steiner. Section 912. We're picking up in the middle of Lecture 5. Burn. 1919. As you know, since the middle of the 15th century, we have been living in an era in which humanity needs increasingly to develop the full power of consciousness. It is one of the very greatest importances that people should approach the coming incarnation of Ariman with full consciousness of this event. <clears throat> the incarnation of Lucifer could be recognized only by the prophetic insight of the priests of the mysteries. People were also very unconscious of what the incarnation of Christ and the events at Golgotha really signified. But they should await the incarnation of Ariman with full consciousness amidst shattering events that will occur on the physical plane. Amidst the perpetual stresses of war and other tribulations of the immediate future, the human mind will become very inventive in the physical domain. And through this very growth of inventiveness in physical life, which cannot be averted in any way or by any means, the bodily existence of a human individuality in whom Ariman can incarnate will become possible and inevitable. From the spiritual world, this Ahrimanic power is preparing for incarnation on the earth, endeavoring in every conceivable way to make preparations enabling the incarnation of Ahriman in human form to utterly mislead and corrupt humanity on earth. A task of humanity during the next phase of civilization will be to live towards the incarnation of Ahriman with such alert consciousness that this development can actually serve to promote higher spiritual development. Though Ahriman himself, through Ahriman himself, Humanity will become aware of what can or shall we say cannot be achieved through physical forces alone. The people must go forward with full consciousness towards the incarnation of Ariman and become more and more alert in every domain in order to recognize with greater and greater clarity those trends in life which are leading towards this Arimanic inception. People must learn from spiritual science to find the key to life and so be able to recognize and learn to control the currents leading towards the incarnation of Ahriman. It must be realized that Ahriman will live among people on the earth, but that in confronting him people will themselves determine that they may learn from him what they may receive from him. This, however, they will not be able to do unless from now onwards they take control of certain spiritual and also unspiritual currents, which otherwise are used by Ariman for the purpose of leaving humanity as deeply unconscious as possible of his coming. Then one day he will be able to appear on Earth and overwhelm people, tempting and luring them to repudiate Earth's evolution, thus preventing it from reaching its goal. To understand this whole process of which I have been speaking, it's essential to recognize the character of certain currents and influences, spiritual or the reverse. Do you not see the continually growing number of people? at the present time who do not want any science of the spirit, any knowledge of the spiritual? Do you not see numerous are the people to whom the old forces of religion no longer give any inner stimulus? Whether they go to church or not is a matter of complete indifference to large numbers of human beings nowadays. The old religious impulses mean nothing to them. But neither they will they bring themselves to give a thought to what can stream into our civilization as new spiritual life. They resist it, reject it, regard it as folly, as something inconvenient. They will not allow themselves to have anything to do with it. But you see, human beings on earth are veritably a unity. Our spiritual nature cannot be separated from our physical nature. Both work together as a unity between birth and death. And even if human beings do not receive the spiritual through their faculties of soul, the spiritual takes effect nonetheless. Since the last third of the 19th century, the spiritual has been streaming around us. It is streaming into earthly evolution. The spiritual is truly present. Only people are not willing to receive it. But even if they do not accept the spiritual, it is there. And what becomes of it? Paradoxical as it may seem, for much that is true seems paradoxical to the modern mind. In those people who refuse the spiritual, and who like eating and drinking best of all things in life, the spiritual streams unconsciously to them, into the processes of eating and digestion, 
This is the secret of that march into materialism which began about the year 1840, or rather was then in active preparation. Those who do not receive the spiritual through their souls receive it today nonetheless. In eating and drinking, they eat and drink the spirit. They devour the soul and spirit. And in this way, the spirit that is streaming into earth evolution passes over into the Luciferic element, is conveyed to Lucifer. Thereby, the Luciferic power, which can then be of help to the harmonic power for its later incarnation, is constantly strengthened. This must come to the knowledge of those who admit the fact that in the future people will either receive spiritual knowledge consciously or consume the spirit unconsciously, thereby delivering it into the hands of Luciferic powers. This stream of spirit soul consumption is particularly encouraged by Ariman because in this way he can lull humankind into greater and greater drowsiness, so that then, through his incarnation, he will be able to come among people and fall upon them unawares because they do not confront him consciously. But Ariman can also make direct preparation for his incarnation, and he does so. Certainly people of our day also have a life of the mind, but is purely intellectual unconnected with the spiritual world. This purely intellectual life is becoming more and more widespread. At first it took effect mainly in the sciences, but now it is leading to excesses of every kind in society too. What is the essential character of this intellectual life? This intellectual life has very little to do with the true interests of human beings. I ask you, how many teachers nowadays pass in and out of higher and lower educational institutions without bringing any inner enthusiasm to their discipline, but pursuing it merely as means of livelihood? In such cases, the interest of the soul is not directly linked with the actual pursuit. The same thing happens even at school. Think how much is learned at various stages of life without any real enthusiasm or interest. How external the intellectual life is becoming for many people who devote themselves to it. And how many there are today who are forced to produce a mass of intellectual material which is then preserved in libraries and as spiritual life is not truly alive. Everything that is developing as intellectual life without being suffused by warmth of soul, without being quickened by enthusiasm, directly furthers the incarnation of Ariman in a way that is after his own heart. It lulls people to sleep in the way I've described so that its results are advantageous to Ariman. There are numerous other currents in the spiritual or unspiritual life which Ariman can turn to his advantage. You have lately heard, and are still hearing, that national states must be founded based on ethnic groups. A great deal is said about the freedom for separate peoples. But the time for founding nations based on relationships of blood and race is past and over in the evolution of mankind. If an appeal is made today to national, racial, and similar relationships, to relationships not based on the spirit, then disharmony will increase amongst humanity. And it is this disharmony which the Ariamonic powers can put to special use. National chauvinism, perverted patriotism in every form, is the material from which Ariman will build just what he needs. But there are other things as well. Every today we see parties being formed of one object or another. People nowadays have no discernment, nor do they desire to have it, where party opinions and party programs are concerned. With intellectual ingenuity, proof can be furnished in support of the most radically opposed theories. Very clever arguments can be used to prove the soundness of Leninism, but the same applies to directly contrary principles and also to what lies between the two extremes. An excellent case can be made out for every party program. But the one who establishes the validity of the opposite program is equally right. The intellectualism prevailing among people today is not capable of demonstrating the inner potentialities and values of anything. I can furnish proofs, but what is intellectually proved should not be regarded as of real value or efficacy in life. People oppose one another in parties because the validity of every party opinion, at any rate the main party opinions, can be proved with equal justification. Our intellect penetrates no further than the surface of understanding and does not reach deeper layers where the truth actually lies. People today prefer to let their intellect remain on the surface and not to penetrate with deeper forces to those levels where the essential nature of things is disclosed. It is only necessary to look around a little for even in its most external form, life often reveals the pitfalls of current predilections. People love numbers and figures in science, but they also love figures in the social sphere as well. Social science consists almost entirely of statistics, and from statistics, that is to say, from figures, the weightiest conclusions are reached. Well, figures can prove anything too and back up any belief. Figures are not a means whereby the essential reality of things can be proven. They are simply a means of deception. 
Wherever one fails to look beyond figures to qualitative aspects, these figures can be utterly deceptive. The following is an obvious example. There is, or at least there used to be, a great deal of argument about the nationality of the Macedonians. In the political life of the Balkan Peninsula much depended upon the statistics compiled there. The figures are of just as much value as those contained in other statistics. Whether statistics are compiled of wheat and rye production, or of the number of Greek, Serbian, or Bulgarian nationals in Macedonia, in regard to what can be proved by these means, it is all the same. From the figures quoted for the Greeks, for the Bulgarians, for the Serbians, very plausible conclusions can be drawn. But one can also have an eye for the qualitative element. And then one often finds it recorded that this father was a Greek, one son was a Bulgarian, another Serbian. What underlies this you can puzzle out for yourselves. These statistics are taken as authoritative, whereas in this case they were compiled solely to support polarity political aims. It stands to reason that if the father is really a Greek, the two sons are also Greeks. But the procedure adopted there is just an example of many other things that are done with figures. Ariman can achieve a great deal through figures and numbers used in this way as evidence of a proof. A further means of which Ariman can avail himself is again one that will seem paradoxical. As you know, we have been concerned in our movement to study the Gospels in the light of spiritual science. But these deeper interpretations of the Gospels, which are becoming more and more necessary in our time, are generally rejected, just as spiritual science as a whole is rejected. Thus concludes section 912 of The Incarnation of Ariman by Rudolf Steiner. Next time we pick up with section 913 in the middle of lecture 5. I will see you then. Alam.